Alcohols, 10 4. You should be done with that already. The general form for an alcohol, we know that it is a functional group of OH, a hydroxyl group attached to some carbon chain. If we had a double bond O and then an OH, then we no longer have an alcohol, we have a carboxylic acid. So we're just looking for nice long straight chain or ring with an OH attached to it. We have two common types of reactions with alcohols. First one is combustion. Combustion. And I want to do a combustion reaction with ethanol. So we're going to write that up here. Um, hmm. So numeric, click in your oh, click in your clicker real quick. How many carbons will be in ethanol? Click it into your clickers. I'm going to end it anyways. Do, 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 do. Yes. Two is correct. Five. Meth, eth, prop, bute, pen, so on and so forth. So, C2. Now, if I'm drawing it out, I have my two carbons. On one of them is going to go my OH. That's why we have the OL there, my alcohol. And then I can put in the rest of my hydrogens. Many of you can view it in your heads without drawing it out. It looks like that. So I have C2, H6, O, C2H6O. Or you could write it C2H5OH. That way you know that it's a hydroxyl group. If I have a combustion reaction, what do I have to react this with? Oxygen, yes. O2. And I have two products whenever I have complete combustion. What are those two products? Water. And I think I heard it, CO2. Carbon dioxide and water are always my products of a complete combustion. If I had an incomplete combustion, if it was not an oxygen-rich environment, what's another product I could have had? Yeah, CO, carbon monoxide. Thank you. Okay, I want you to balance this out, and then I want you to click in the coefficient that would be in front of the water. Again, I'm looking for moles of water. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a few more seconds. If you don't get it, don't panic. Try to get it in. Coefficient or the number of moles of water. this one. And I would need three moles of water. That is absolutely correct. So if I put, I have two carbons here, so I put a two as my coefficient in front of CO2. 
take a look at my hydrogens. I need six of them. I have two there, so I put a three there. Then I just have to look at my oxygens. I have one there and two there. I have three there, four there, so I'm looking for seven total. Again, with that one oddball there, I'd have a three O2s. What questions do you have before we move on? So our second type of reaction that alcohols undergo are dehydration reactions. And what happens is an alcohol becomes an alkene. So we go to single bonds with an OH group, all of a sudden becoming something that is doubly bonded. Requires heat and either sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid. And one of the products of this is H2O. And we can see that by looking at what's going on here. Let's pick our most basic one, ethanol again. Doesn't matter where I put the hydroxyl group, it's just going to be on one of those spots on the carbons. Okay, it's going to lose an H2O. So I'm going to have H2O plus my leftover stuff, so I have C, double bond C, H, 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 H. So in essence, we're rearranging. I'm taking, let's say, that hydroxyl group and that hydrogen. And I need heats high enough and either sulfuric or phosphoric acid. Yeah, it won't really matter. This is just a diagram of what's happening in general. Good question. Okay. Okay. In industry, we can produce alcohols with steam. So really high energy particles of water. Phosphoric acid and an aluminum oxide catalyst and high pressures. So alcohol can be combusted, can be dehydrated, and we can create alcohol in this way. Anticipate that you will see questions dealing with the specifics of these. So something like how would you produce alcohol in industry? Well, I need an aluminum oxide catalyst in the presence of phosphoric acid, steam, and high pressure. So lots of memorization with this one. Okay. We have three classes of alcohols. So we can look at what the carbon that has the hydroxyl group on is attached to whether it's other hydrogens or carbons or what it is and we name it in three ways we can either have a primary alcohol which has one carbon on the carbon that has the OH group so what that means is I have a carbon with a hydroxyl group that's my alcohol it's going to have two hydrogens attached to it and then some other carbon group stuff's going on over here. doesn't really matter to us what's going on over there, but it's attached to one other carbon. So I take a look at my carbon that contains my hydroxyl group and I see how many carbons are around it. Just one. Makes it primary. I can also have secondary, which has two carbons that are attached to the carbon that has the hydroxyl group. 
So I'm going to draw that out with my carbon that has the hydroxyl group. Now it has two carbon things attached to it. Do, 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 stuff's going on, and one extra hydrogen. That's my secondary alcohol. Now the type of alcohol that it is will determine what types of reactions we can undergo. That's why it's important to know. The bulkier the stuff we have, the harder it is for a lot of our reactions to occur. Okay, tertiary, third one, carbon, hydroxyl group, and then around that carbon are three more carbon groups of stuff. Da 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 So we've got big bulky things around this carbon, which would make it more difficult for something to happen to this hydroxyl group. Just an image here. Um, again, here's a nice easy one. That carbon has one carbon attached, that carbon has two attached, that carbon has three attached. I want to go through some more naming, because the more naming we do, the better practice we have, the better we're going to do on the test. So, take a look at those three. Don't think about the water. We know that's dihydrogen monoxide. Look at the three organic molecules and think through your naming rules. So, count how many carbons there are. Determine the prefix. Meth, eth, pope, but, pent, hex, hep, oct, non, dec. Think about those. Figure out how to name these. Write them down on your sheet. using that for something else. Yeah. I want you to click in how many carbons are in the longest chain in this one carbon one. The primary alcohol. How many carbons are in the longest chain? this and we do have two which means one two count it from my nearest one even if it was on this one it would be the same thing this is just ethanol how many carbons are in my longest chain in my secondary alcohol Plus you. Okay, three is absolutely correct. Okay, so I've got one, two, three. So I've got propan. This time I need to be specific about where my OH group is because it could be on either of my end ones as well. So I need to say it's propan two all. Yeah, Elliot. Why isn't it two propanes? That's a good question. It's standard practice if we have an alcohol just to put it right in front of the all so that we know that it's the alcohol part of it. I'm not sure why they chose to do it that way because it, logically it makes sense the other way as well. Sorry. Okay, I want to know longest chain for my last one as well, my tertiary. How many carbons are in my longest chain? <coughs> okay. 
and this one, three are in my longest chain. So I see I have one, two, three. The one that's off here isn't part of that chain. If this kept going and had that CH3 over here, then it would be. But it's not. It's attached to one that is in my chain. So I have two functional groups. I have a hydroxyl group, which makes it an alcohol, and I have a methyl group. So I need to be specific about where they are. I would say two methyl propan to all. So my methyl is on my second carbon. My carbon chain has three propan. There's an alcohol on my second carbon to all. What questions do you have before we move on? From three carbons in my back chain and then the hydroxyl group. From this extra CH3 that's now attached to it. Okay, moving along. Primary alcohols can be oxidized easily. Readily oxidized. Oxidized easily. Because there are two hydrogen atoms that can be taken away easily. So the first step of the reaction produces an aldehyde. Let's say I've got some long chain here. My carbon that has a hydrogen, a hydroxyl group, and a hydrogen. So this hydrogen, let's say, and this hydrogen can go off together and either bond to something else or form H2. But that means that my carbon and my oxygen are now unhappy because they don't have the correct number of bonds. So what they do is form the aldehyde. There we go. So my R group, my carbon, with my hydrogen that was still on there, and a double bond to my oxygen. So my oxygen now has two bonds, my carbon has four, so it, both of those are stable. And again, R is just some carbon chain. We can then continue this and get a carboxylic acid. So what could come in is a hydroxyl group, replace that hydrogen, kick it out of the way, bonds right there. You should read about the conditions in the book. So the last one we said had to have aluminum oxide, phosphoric acid. You need to know that about this as well. So look it up in your book read about those conditions and know them. Who's reacting with something else? And you'll see that in the conditions. Good question. Okay, so this one was the easiest to have any oxidation occur with. Secondary alcohols may be oxidized once to form a ketone. And that's because it's got more stuff around it, so it's harder for it to lose the hydrogen that's nearby that'll react with the other hydrogen that's attached to the oxygen. So it's not going to happen as easily. And R and R again are some groups that are attached to either of the carbons that may or may not be the same. Even though it's R and R prime, they may be the same thing. Mm -hmm, but they don't have to. Be. It's not going to oxidize a second time. There's no place for a hydrogen or hydroxyl group to come in. It's not going to kick out a big R group. 
So let's look at our third type, tertiary alcohols. They're not readily going to be oxidized. They've got so much stuff around them that it's not going to be easy to take hydrogens away from it. That's 10-4. Ready for 10-5? Yes. yes. Okay. Halogenoalkanes, a.k.a. haloalkanes. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Haloalkanes. So our halogens bonded to alkane groups. We saw some of those in the packet, like bromine. What would that be called? Bromo. Yes, very nice. What about chlorine? Oh, beautiful. Fluorine? Fluorine. Nice. Iodine. Iodo. Isn't that a funny name? I love it. Okay, so the basics, we've got that general form Rx, where R is some alkane chain and X is the halogen. So again, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. I suppose astatine could theoretically be, but it's not very stable, so probably not. Not been very prevalent in nature. Yeah. S yeah. That'd be funny. Okay, we know that halogens, because of where they are on the periodic table, they really want one more electron. Which ma makes them very electronegative. So the bond that they form with the carbon is going to be a polar bond. So if I have Let's just make it easy. Uh, chloromethane. Really easy ones. If I have a whole container of chloromethane, that entire container is held together probably in a liquid form because of the intermolecular forces being difficult to overcome. Um, all dipole-dipole intermolecular forces because we've got that polar bond. Why is it not hydrogen bonding? There's hydrogens in methane chloromethane or let's say chloral or fluoral fluoromethane do that one because we know hydrogen bonding is almost fun okay so we remember that so let's say it's fluoromethane why is that not hydrogen bonding uh -huh. Th that's getting close. So the it's dealing with the electronegativities. Hmm? Why is it hydrogen what? Why wouldn't fluoral methane be hydrogen bonding? Go ahead, Caleb. Because the electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is not enough to make it. Yeah. Mm hmm. So if you think about it, when we're dealing with hydrogen bonding. It has to be hydrogen bonding to nitrogen or oxygen or fluorine. It just doesn't have to be in the same chemical. So if I have CH3F, the fluorine and the carbon is what I'm looking at, or the hydrogen and the carbon at the electronegativity differences. It would be a dipole-dipole intermolecular force holding all of these fluoromethanes methanes together, but it wouldn't be hydrogen bonding holding them together, so it's my middle intermolecular force. What's my weakest intermolecular force? Van der Waals. Lovely. Thank you. Is there another word for that one? London dispersion. London dispersion. Yes. Very nice. Okay. Good review for you. Good for that biochem that you're doing right now. Okay. Carbon has a partial positive charge because of this high electronegativity of my fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Okay, it has high electronegativity. It's pulling the shared electrons towards it more of the time. That means carbon doesn't have those electrons around it more of the time, not even the one that belonged to it to start with, so it's partially positive. We have these things called nucleophiles out in the world. They're something that have an extra electron pair. So they want to bond with something. <coughs> so maybe they've broken off of something else already. Now they need something new to bond to. 
sometimes we'll see a hydroxyl group, OH, that really wants to bond with something. It's to find something to bond with. So what will happen is that nucleophile is going to attack the center of that positive charge. So again, my chlorine that's bonded to my methyl group, my CH3, it's pulling the electrons towards it more. That carbon is partially positive, so that hydroxyl group will come in and bond with that carbon. But that puts that carbon out of whack. It's not stable anymore. It has too many bonds. So something else has to happen. I'm going to see what that is in a moment. Okay, so we have two types of nucleophilic substitution. So that's where a nucleophile comes in and replaces my functional group. And in these, we're talking about halo alkanes. So I have some functional nucleophile coming in, kicking out my halogen. So SN1 is one of them. And what that means is substitution, S, N for nucleophilic reaction, and 1 means that one thing is present at the rate determining step. Rate determining. Thinking back to rates last year, that's just how long the reaction is going to occur. So I have two steps with this. My first step is my slow one. It's my rate determining one. And this is where the halogen breaks away from the alkane of its own accord. And it's going to yield an intermediate carbocation. It's kind of a fun word to say too. So I have Let's say, let's say I have R this time. C H H C L. Okay, that chlorine's more electronegative. It's pulling those electrons around it more than the carbon more of the time. Eventually it gets enough energy and it breaks all the way off. So now I have chlorine. Cl1 negative, it's going to find something else to bond to original, eventually, excuse me. And I have my RCHH that's partially positive. So delta, or actually it's totally positive now, what am I saying? Totally positive now, because it's lost both of those electrons. The one that it started with plus the one that it was sharing from the chlorine. So it's positive. This is my intermediate carbocation. And this is my one thing that's present at that rate determining step. It's not going to last very long because that carbocation wants to bond with something else. So hopefully there's some water or something around that it can react with very quickly. Hopefully quickly. And it's going to react with some anion, perhaps hydroxyl group, to yield the final product. So in the one that I was drying, oops. I have R, C, H, H, O, H. So I've gone from a primary haloalkane or halogenoalkane to a primary alcohol. That's one way to do it. And you're going to see fun animations of this and interact with some fun anim animations. On Monday, we're going to be in one of the computer labs doing a web lab. Yeah. Okay, skip that.
Uh, for this unit, um, whatever it says on the calendar, it's early October. I don't remember off the top of my head. Thank you. Hmm? Oops, that's not what I wanted. Wrong thing. Um, I want us to ignore... Well, the image is slightly okay. It's going in the opposite direction with the formation of a halo alkane as opposed to the formation of a hydroxyl or an alcohol, um, but the same thing's happening. So SN2 substitution, nucleophilic reaction, but two things at the intermediate step. So this time, we've got that anion. In this case, it's bromine coming in, and at that same time, it's kicking out the hydroxyl group that's going to bond to something else like extra hydrogen that's around it. So I've got these temporary bonds, that's what these dotted lines are, between what's coming in and what's going out. That's the fun one to watch because you see one coming in and the other one start going. Kind of looks like slime. Still see a few pens going, so I'm going to wait here a little longer. Okay, we said we have three types of haloalkanes. We also have, or three types of alcohols. We also have three types of haloalkanes or halogenoalkanes. Same names as before: primary, secondary, and tertiary. <coughs> Same setup as before too. So I have whatever my halogen is bonded to one carbon. That's bonded to another carbon. Secondary, it's bonded to two other carbon groups. Tertiary, it's bonded to three other carbon groups. Again, due to the bulkiness of those R groups, that's going to determine what types of reactions they can undergo. So primary, typically going to be SN2. So I have one thing coming in and pushing out the other one at the same time, and I get that intermediate where it's kind of half bonded to each of them at the same time. Secondary can really undergo either. There's not so many carbon groups around it that this halogen or this alcohol group can't force its way in. Once I get to tertiary though, I've got so many carbon groups around it that it's hard for one thing to come in and bump out another thing. So typically, I have to lose that halogen first before my nucleophile can come in. What questions do you have? We will be. Not today.